Uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. Kirkland. He's director of the Robert and Arlene Cog Cogod Center on Aging at Mayo Clinic and Nobar Foundation Professor of Aging Research. His research focuses on the contribution of fundamental aging processes, particularly cellular senescence to chronic and age-related diseases. His research also looks at developing agents and strategies to target fundamental aging mechanism in the service of treating age and chronic disease-related conditions and morbidities. There, there's a very long bio on Jim. I won't go through the whole thing. But I just wanted to highlight that Dr. Kirkland is president of the American Fe Federation of Aging Research, a past member of the National Advisory Council on Aging of the National Institutes of Health in the United States, past chair of the Biological Sciences section of the Gerontology Society of America, and he's a board-certified specialist in internal medicine, geriatrics, and endocrinology and metabolism. And Dr. Kirkland, Kirkland is the 2020 recipient of the Irving S. Wright award a distinction from the American Federation for Aging Research. And more importantly, uh, Jim is also on the Scientific Advisory Board for the Canadian Longitudinal <laughs> Study on Aging. Jim. Thank you very much. Uh, can, can you hear me all right? Um, I'm going to, I know I'm between you and uh, free beer, and my talk was supposed to be an hour, so I'm going to have to um, shorten it. Uh, I hope I don't lose anyone along the way. Um, so by way of disclosure, I was a um, co-founder of a company that eventually became Unity Biotechnology, but I got out of it early. I don't have any commercial links now because I'm running clinical trials. And in the US, uh, for the last two years, if you're involved in consenting subjects, you're not allowed to have any commercial relations. So um, as you're aware, there are a number of things that appear across the vertebrates and invertebrates to accelerate the rate at which um, uh, age-related changes occur. Of course, aging begins at or before conception. Uh, Down syndrome, which is related to aging of the oocyte, is an age-related disease. It's caused by cellular senescence. That's fairly clear now. There are trials going to begin in adult Down syndrome of clearing senescent cells. So these processes occur um, across certainly the vertebrates and to some extent the invertebrates. Uh, and you, you know of many things that can accelerate some of these processes. There are genetic changes, there are changes in uh, diet, uh, changes, you know, various lifestyle factors, things like having had chemotherapy, previous infection, uh, a number of things that can tend to speed up the rate at which some of these processes occur. There's um, what we call the pillars of aging, and people divide them up into anywhere from four to 13 categories of fundamental processes uh, that appear to be between things which drive aging processes to occur and the phenotypic outcomes. Um, these processes, it's called the geroscience hypothesis, appear to be upstream root cause contributors of the bulk of the conditions that cause most morbidity, mortality, and health expenditures around the world. Um, so I like to think simply and divide them up into four categories that are tightly interlinked in what we call the unitary theory of fundamental aging processes. We've got a paper coming out in Nature Medicine in a couple of weeks that goes through all of this and the evidence for this unitary theory. But it, it appears that if you target any one of these processes, you tend to affect all of the rest. And there are, uh, I'll, as I'll mention in a moment now, there are many ways you can intervene with these processes uh, at lifestyle, nutritional, and um, uh, nutraceutical and pharmacologic levels. So one of these processes is cellular senescence, which I'm going to focus on by way of example. Another involves inflammation, which tends to be low-grade chronic and sterile, that is in the absence of known bacteria and fungi, and is associated with fibrosis. Another group of processes are macromolecular and involve um, changes in organelles and cells, so things like um, uh, telomeric dysfunction, uh, changes in epigenetic folding, or even the way that chrom chromosomes, chromosomes are anchored to the nuclear envelope, uh, single strand breaks, other things with DNA. There are things with proteins, like formation of protein aggregates, or um, uh, misfolded proteins, or um, uh, failed autophagy with respect to proteins. There are problems with sugars, like advanced glycation end product formation. Hemoglobin A1C is an example of a, of a 
of a glycation end product, but the same, Meyer, the same reaction, the Meyer reaction, that same reaction um, affects amino groups in proteins generally and in DNA backbones and results in changes in the structure of proteins in DNA throughout life. Uh, there, there are changes in uh, lipids with increased productions of things like various ceramides, bradykines, and so forth. And then there are a lot of changes in intracellular organelles that I don't have time to go through. Uh, the nucleus prominently with changes uh, in, in membranes related to lamins, changes in lysosomes, pronounced changes in mitochondria, which are little organisms living within us, and that signal events from cell to cell, and many other things. And then there are changes in so-called stem cell. I don't like calling them stem cells. Uh, because if you have a stem cell in you, it's going to turn into a teratocarcinoma. It's not a good thing to have. Uh, they're really progenitor cells. Uh, and there are profound changes in both directions, either increases in their function or decreases, depending on the situation. For example, osteoclastic progenitor function increases with age. Osteoclasts form our cells that break down bone. Osteoblastic uh, progenitor uh, production Increase, it decreases with age, and these are the cells that form new bones. So this, this occurs across systems. And these things are tightly interlinked. And they appear to be upstream of the geriatric syndromes, things like mild cognitive impairment or sarcopenia, um, of multiple diseases, both acute and chronic. I'm going to focus on infectious diseases here. But um, um, as, as you're aware, um, your relative risk of having a heart attack or stroke is increased two to fourfold by having a high blood sugar, high uh, blood pressure, high cholesterol, positive family history, but if you're 85 as opposed to 30, your risk is increased 1,000-fold. And so it goes, goes on down the list of around, of around 200 conditions, the most common conditions, that if you put age as a predictor on a histogram, um, you don't even see the other risk factors for almost any condition. Uh, and then these fundamental aging processes appear to drive what we call decreased physical resilience. That is, decreased ability to respond, for example, to a vaccine, to recover after an infection or after surgery or chemotherapy, um, and so forth. So um, <clears throat> there are at least 35 categories of interventions now that will affect uh, the operation of these fundamental aging processes. I'm going to just focus on one group of them. Um, and I'm going to talk about cellular senescence. Now, cellular senescence is a cell fate, like replication, differentiation, apoptosis, or necrosis. Any cell at any point during life can become senescent, including non-dividing cells. Senescence occurs across the vertebrates and in some invertebrates as well. It's a damage response. Um, so if uh, there are at least 70 factors now that can tend to push a cell into becoming senescent. Uh, senescent cells, um, if they're dividing, they uh, develop essentially irreversible replicative arrest, and you want them to be in an irreversible replicative arrest because if they escape that, they come back as cancers. Uh, they um, um, are very resistant to dying, and that's because of operation of pathways we found that are called senescent cell anti-apoptotic pathways. So they, they don't divide, they're very metabolically active, and they don't die. They're normally only removed by the innate immune system. Uh, the rate of removal of them depends on uh, individual's age as well. It's mainly natural killer cells that remove them. It, um, after, uh, amongst the other things that can induce cellular senescence are replicative stress, mechanical stress. This is the basis for senescence forming in the knee joint and osteoarthritis. Uh, shear stress. This is how senescent cells form at bifurcations of blood vessels. Um, hyperoxia, I'll talk about in a moment, hypoxia. Um, uh, protein aggregates can cause cells to become senescent, so tau, synuclein, uh, amyloid will cause cells to become senescent, and senescent cells make these proteins. So these processes are, are often cyclic. Uh, what we call um, uh, damage-associated molecular pattern proteins, or factors in general, can make a cell become senescent. So, it, and this is beyond proteins. So if there's extracellular DNA, for example, uh, it, signaling that neighboring cells have broken down, that will drive neighboring cells to become senescent. And what I'll focus on here are going to be pathogen molecular uh, pattern proteins, or PAMPs. So PAMPs, uh, things related to bacteria, fungi, and viruses, can make cells become senescent. Um, 
it takes, uh, importantly, it takes anywhere from a week to six weeks for a cell to become senescent. So it's much slower than other cell fates. And this affects how we administer drugs that clear senescent cells. I'll come back to that. There are no perfect markers of cellular senescence. So typically we have to measure four or five things on a slide, uh, for example, if we're looking at a cell before we're semi-comfortable about calling it senescent. Not every senescent cell is an increase in P16 that you might have heard of. Not every senescent cell is an increase in P21. <clears throat> Virtually all senescent cells develop something called a senescence-associated secretory phenotype. But this varies considerably among senescent cells. In 30 to 70 percent of senescent cells, it can be pro-inflammatory and pro-apoptotic, that is, causing cell death. In other senescent cells, it can be pro-growth. Um, and um, it, it tends to be the pro-inflammatory, pro-apoptotic form of the senescence-associated secretory phenotype that entails also production of factors that degrade extracellular matrix and spread senescence, as I'll talk about, to other cells locally and systemically that causes problems and appears to be related to development of adverse phenotypes. Senescence is a beneficial thing in many circumstances, so senescent cells forming during fetal development remodel the fetus. Senescent cells form in the placenta in the last five days of pregnancy, and the SASP of senescent cells in the placenta is what drives a baby through the birth canal. And it's escape of senescence from the placenta that seems to be an upstream cause of preeclampsia, for example. Uh, senescent cells are important in inhibiting cancer development. So I mentioned before that repeated replication and oncogenes can drive a cell to become senescent. That stops them dividing, so that helps the cancer spreading. But it also means that many senescent cells harbor cancerous mutations. Furthermore, these, the 30 to 70 percent of these senescent cells that are cancer harboring produce factors that kill the cells around them, so they help to destroy a developing cancer. So if you, get, if you prevent senescent cells from forming, you cause cancer. If you um, prevent um, P53 from being expressed, as many of you will know that, that this occurs in breast cancers, in triple negative breast cancer, for example, that prevents senescent cells from forming and can make things worse. Conversely, I'll talk about, I, I probably won't have time to talk about it, but senescent cells, once a cancer is established, make the cancer much worse. And um, senescent cells can make normal cells become cancerous. So there, there's a complex relationship. Um, and senescent cells are important. The, the pro-growth type of senescent cells, not the damaging ones, but the 30 to 70 percent of them that produce PDGFA and ghrelin alpha are important in wound healing. But the damaging ones prevent and delay wound healing and appear to be very important in development of diabetic skin ulcers, for example, and their failure to resolve. So senescence can occur, as I mentioned, at any point during life. Working with Dr. Prakash, who's chair of physiology at Mayo, we found that resuscitating babies with hyperoxia af af after just as they're born results in cellular senescence in the lungs that leads to asthma when these kids become two to four years old. So these processes can occur, uh, these fundamental aging processes, if they're driven too quickly or under the wrong circumstances, can affect disorders, diseases, and disabilities from childhood to uh, late adulthood. This shows senescent cells in adipose tissue of an obese, diabetic, younger woman with impending renal dysfunction on, the, on, the, on your right. On the left is a slightly older woman who's not obese and diabetic. High blood sugar, high insulin, uh, both drive cells to become senescent. 33 millimolar glucose will do it. We just had a paper out showing that hyperinsulinemia insulin, insulin will do it in the liver. So um, you'll note that many of these conditions I'm talking about, like um, pregnancy, um, cancers, obstructive lung disease, asthma, diabetes, are things which are associated with worse coronavirus infection and complications, and I'll come back to that. So um, senescent cells can accumulate in individuals with aging. If they're healthy, they tend to accumulate to a very small extent, but individuals who are frail and of multimorbidity, they accumulate to a much larger extent. But even in relatively healthy people, here we took people who were uh, kidney uh, donors, grandparents donating kidneys to grandchildren, for example, who are 
guaranteed to be pretty healthy or the surgeons won't take one of their kidneys to give to their relative. And we looked at their perirenal fat and we found that somewhere between the ages of 60 and 80, there was an exponential increase in senescent cell number in perinephric fat, but it's slight. It goes from, you know, 1% or less to around 6 to 8% of cells. But in frail individuals, you find many more senescent cells, say in adipose tissue biopsies or other tissues than in non-frail individuals. Um, if you transplant very small numbers of senescent cells into experimental animals, you cause severe dysfunction. So if we transplant small numbers of senescent cells that are autologous, taken from ear fibroblasts that are irradiated, and put back into the same mouse, and these are middle-aged mice, if one in 10,000 cells in that mouse is a transplanted senescent cell, they develop frailty with decreased grip strength, decreased running speed, and after a lag period, they die of all diseases that mice die of naturally at a later age if they're not transplanted. So again, consistent with the Jarrah science hypothesis, it looks like if you accelerate any one of these fundamental aging processes, you affect every condition that, um, that mammals die from, uh, that, that we can detect. So uh, they, they do appear to be root cause contributors. Now, if we transplant instead of a million senescent cells so that one in 10 million senescent cell, it, cells in the transplanted mouse is senescent. If we transplant a million senescent cells, we get these phenotypes occurring. If we transplant 500,000, nothing happens. But if we transplant 500,000 senescent cells into an older mouse, they get the syndrome. They get accelerated frailty and earlier death. If we transplant 500,000 senescent cells into an obese middle-aged mouse, they get the syndrome. So there's a threshold effect. Once you're above a threshold, um, you get these syndromes occurring. If you're below that threshold, you don't. And part of the reason for that is that senescence um, spreads um, from um, cell to cell. So if we um, label the senescent cells that we transplant so that we can follow which cells are the transplanted cells and distinguish them from the recipient cells, we find senescence spreads both locally and systemically. So if we transplant the senescent cells into the peritoneum of a mouse so they stay in their intra-abdominal fat tissue, which is where they tend to hone, they love fat tissue, um, you find the, mouse's, uh, the recipient mouse's own cells start becoming senescent in its arms and its legs. So this can spread in an endocrine manner. A number of the factors that do this are now known. The SASP that I talked about before entails production of not only proteins, but also bioactive uh, lipids, um, things like ceramides and bradykines. Um, uh, the, it entails production of other bioactive molecules like reactive oxygen species. Uh, it entails production of a lot of non-coding nucleotides, particularly microRNAs, circular DNAs, and mitochondrial DNA. It looks like some of these uh, microRNAs and mitochondrial DNA, as well as certain inflammatory mediators that senescent cells produce, are what spread senescence in an endocrine manner. So we know what some of these things are now. Um, and this means that if you transplant, we did this work with Stefan Tullius, who's uh, chief of transplant surgery at Harvard. Um, we transplanted hearts from old mice to young mice and young mice to young mice. We found that, and, and young mice to old mice. We found that when you transplant hearts from old mice to young mice, uh, the young mouse's own cells start becoming senescent in their livers and the hearts from the old mice uh, produce, as part of their SAS, mitochondrial DNA, which activates ganglion cells in draining lymph nodes and causes transplant rejection. The surgeons know this. Uh, in the United States at the moment, they're throwing away 35,000 kidneys a year from people who die over age 50 in car accidents because the surgeons will not use organs from older donors even if they look good because they know that this kind of phenomenon occurs. If we could solve this, we would solve the entire organ shortage. Uh, furthermore, we find that if we transplant hearts from young animals to old animals, the old animals do a bit better. I, I don't really have time to go into that, but that's related to a factor called alpha-clotho, which senescent cells inhibit, which is a neuroprotective factor and also uh, protects the kidneys. And alpha-clotho overexpression, more than anything else in mice, results in extension of health span and lifespan by over 30%. So um, senescent cells produce factors that decrease alpha-clotho in the brain and elsewhere. It's decreased in Alzheimer's disease, it's decreased in cancers, decreased in diabetes. 
And if you get rid of senescent cells, as uh, I'll, I'll mention very briefly, you restore alpha clotho, including in humans. So um, a very important paper came out by Ned Sharpless, who's now director of the National Cancer Institute. He's about to step down in 2004 in Journal of Clinical Investigation. He found that um, caloric restriction, which increases health span and lifespan in mice, also delays accumulation of senescent cells. So there was an association that he established, and that led us, Tamara Ciccone and I, when we were in Boston still before we moved to Mayo, to ask, is this an association or is it causal? And we set out to try to develop agents that would selectively kill senescent cells. We used all kinds of approaches and got nowhere. We started off by making early fusion proteins that would bind on one end of the senescent cell and carry a toxic cargo, got nowhere, tried high throughput screens. Then it hit us in 2013, and it only took us a month to develop senolytics once this hit us. Senescent cells are living despite the fact, the, the bad guy ones at 30 to 70 percent that have a pro-apatotic SASP. They survive despite the fact they're killing the cells around them. So that led us to ask, why are they surviving despite the fact they're killing cells around them? Why don't they commit suicide? And this is very similar to what you see with B lymphomas and chronic lymphocytic leukemia, where there's upregulation of pro-survival pathways that defend those kinds of cancers against committing suicide. So we used our early proteomics approaches and bioinformatics approaches to ask, are there pathways that defend senescent cells against the noxious things, that 30 to 70 percent that are damaging, that defend them against the things that they're using to kill other cells. And we found five pathways to begin with. Since then, another have been found, and we call this the SCAP network. So they're highly interrelated um, uh, sets of uh, pathways. We tested key nodes on this network by uh, using RNA interference approaches to knock down key nodes. And we found that we were able to kill the 30 to 70 percent of senescent cells that have a pro-apatotic, pro-inflammatory SASP while leaving the senescent cells alone that do not. We found that the particular elements of this SCAP network you had to target differed between different human senescent cell types. Human fat cell progenitors, which are amongst the most common senescent cells in, in people, uh, depend on different SCAPs to defend themselves against suicide than human endothelial cells. Uh, the main pathways involved in um, mesenchymal cells, like uh, preadipocytes, uh, involve at what we call efferin-dependent kinases, SARC kinases. They're a kind of tyrosine kinase. I'll come back to that because that's the basis of some of the drugs. Whereas HUVEX depend on BCL2 family members. Um, BCL2 uh, targeting agents are used for treating various leukemias and lymphomas and scleroderma and other things. So we went to uh, the Broad Institute and we given this knowledge that we had now about this network, and we looked for, um, using bioinformatics approaches, natural products and pre, uh, previously approved drugs that were on the formulary that would target key nodes on these networks. Um, we identified 40 that in theory we thought should be senolytic, and they turned out to be senolytic. We focused early on on the agents that we thought were the safest and have short elimination half-lives, because we wanted to get them through to clinical trials. Uh, a couple of the agents that we focused on earlier are disatinib, which is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, but it's unlike imatinib and other general tyrosine kinase inhibitors in that it targets SARC kinase, that pathway that I mentioned, uh, senescence, damaging senescent mesenchymal cells depend on. We found that it would kill the 30 to 70 percent of senescent human uh, fat cell progenitors uh, that have a pro-apatotic SASP, and it does not kill endothelial cells as we predicted. We looked at another age <coughs> early on car called quercetin. It's a flavonoid. It's what makes apple peels taste bitter. Um, we predicted, because it targets BCL2-related families and certain heat shock proteins, that it would kill senescent endothelial cells, human endothelial cells, but not preadipocytes, and that was the case. Uh, the combination killed both cell types, and in fact, we found, or Paul Robbins at University of Minnesota working with us, found that um, disatinib alone wouldn't kill some human cell types, nor would carcetin, but the combination did. And that's because these SCAT pathways can be redundant. Senescent cells can have more than one of them, and you have to target more than one of them to kill that senescent cell. So the combination of disatinib and carcetin hits these nodes. Uh, another agent that we found early on, and I'm just belaboring these ones because these are the ones in clinical trials at the moment, uh, is fizetin. It's a close relative of carcetin. It's one hydroxyl group different. Uh, it's in strawberries and cucumbers. 
Uh, the kind of doses, though, that we're giving in the clinical trials, you would have to eat 15 pounds of strawberries within five minutes uh, to get the dose that we're giving. It's got a very short elimination half-life, which was attractive to us. And the same with desatinib. Desatinib in humans has a three-hour elimination half-life, Kersetin 11 hours, Fizetin about three hours. In mice, Fizetin has a half-hour elimination half-life. And that's because we're trying to develop what we call a hit-and-run approach. I told you before that it takes a week to six weeks for new senescent cells to form. So we want to get rid of them and then not have to give the drug. So using that original mechanism-based approach, um, a whole lot more senolytics were found, including the most recent one was pro cyanidin in C1, which we worked on with Dr. Sun in Shanghai. He's a collaborator there. Uh, it's in uh, grapeseed extract. Uh, and um, now second generation high throughput screens have been developed as well as vaccine and CAR-T approaches. Um, if we transplant senescent cells into mice that are emitting a light signal after we administer luciferase, and we, or, we give these drugs orally. The first drugs we developed, we wanted to use orally active agents for obvious reasons, uh, as opposed to having to give things intravenously. Uh, we found that we kill the 30 to 70% of transplanted senescent cells that are pro-apoptotic and pro-inflammatory, while we do not kill transplanted non-senescent cells of the same type that, are, uh, that have a luciferase signal. If we put human adipose tissue, like from that obese diabetic younger woman I showed you, right out of the operating room into a, into a dish, and we add senolytics, we only have to add them for somewhere between an hour to three hours for them to start killing senescent cells, and that process takes 18 hours. So we can give these drugs in a hit and run manner, arguably. Uh, and this just shows that we're killing these, uh, we're actually killing senescent cells. This is one of the better assays for senescence called the TAF assay. It's about 90% sensitive and specific. It's the best one we have. None of them are perfect. And this is telomer-associated DNA damage foci. Um, if we radiate a single leg on a mouse so that the hair on its leg goes gray after a couple of months and it has trouble running on a treadmill, we just have to give one or two doses of these agents in the mouse's lifetime for it to be able to run on a treadmill the same way as a sham radiated mouse. Because again, we're using a hit and run approach. The FDA has viewed this more like developing antibiotics than like developing antihypertensives. Where in a urinary tract infection, you might give one or two doses of multiple drugs, you're going after a cell type, and you're going after not only urinary tract infections, but maybe meningitis, endocarditis, et cetera. We're not using a one drug, one target, one disease approach the way you would with an antihypertensive. So we've dealt with the FDA in a very different way. Um, those um, in old mice, we find that senolytics, in, once these mice are frail, alleviate frailty. That's the basis for some clinical trials. In uh, mice with um, diet-induced or genetic obesity, we're able to alleviate peripheral insulin resistance and also uh, hepatic steatosis and other complications of obesity and diabetes. If we transplant human um, uh, fat tissue from obese compared to lean subjects into um, partially immunodeficient skid mice, we get a diabetes-like syndrome in the mice that are transplanted with the human uh, adipose tissue from diabetic subjects, but not from non-diabetic subjects. And if we treat those animals with senolytics, um, in, given that we've transplanted human adipose tissue, we alleviate their diabetes and insulin resistance. Um, if we, um, we, we find that senescent cells attract, activate, and anchor both innate and immune, both, both innate and adaptive immune cells. I don't have time to go into all the details, but um, they especially appear to attract, activate, and anchor macrophages uh, and a variety of other cell types on the innate side. Uh, and on the, um, on the adaptive side, it's very complicated. I don't have time to go into it, but they, will, they have different effects on Tregs than other cell types, for example. Um, in those obese mice, one of the things I mentioned before is senescence can spread. Uh, we, with collaborators at Mayo, found that senescence can spread from fat tissue to the brain. Um, the, there are senescent cells that form in the ependema around the third ventricle. Uh, they uh, cause neuroinflammation, neurofibrosis, gliosis, and failed circulation. They affect the limbic system. And in mice like in humans, um, anxiety and depression are associated with obesity. You can measure anxiety in mice because they're afraid of the edges of an open field. You know, they're afraid of birds. Obese mice are much more afraid of an open space than lean mice. If we give senolytics, we're able to restore um, uh, um, 
circulation in the brain, reduce neurofibrosis, uh, uh, enhance neurogenesis, new, new nerve cell formation, and we alleviate their anxiety. Those transplanted mice that I mentioned before, if we treat with um, uh, just a short course of five days of senolytics, we alleviate the frailty and the accelerated aging-like state that occurs if we transplant mice with their own autologous senescent cells. If we um, treat the mice that are transplanted with hearts from old animals, if we either treat the, the, the donor mouse that's giving the heart, the heart itself, or the recipient mouse, we um, extend lifespan of uh, older anim of, 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 these, of these animals. So that's the basis for a lot of the trials underway with uh, trying to rehabilitate kidneys and livers before transplantation. So there are at least 70 things now, uh, I don't have time to go into them all, where um, senolytics uh, appear to delay, prevent, alleviate, or treat uh, disorders in mice, rats, and monkeys. Um, and I could say this about other agents too, like rapalogs, rapamycin, the way it works is by inhibiting the secretory state of senescent cells, at least the protein side. Metformin, which acts on mitochondrial complex four, also inhibits the secretory state of senescent cells. This is partly how it works. So all these drugs interact with each other. <clears throat> now, with respect to uh, infection, we found that um, uh, antigens in uh, bacterial, fungal, and viral infections um, can amplify the SASP of senescent cells. So those senescent cells that have a benign secretory phenotype, we can make them become pro-inflammatory. And those that already have a pro-inflammatory phenotype, we make it much worse. This, in this case, I'm showing lipopolysaccharide. But we can use multiple bacterial antigens and show the same thing. Um, the, the SASP of senescent cells, if you take a non-senescent cell near it, increases ACE2 and TMPRSS2, which are two of the proteins necessary for coronavirus to enter cells. Furthermore, um, senescent cells near non-senescent cells decrease innate antiviral defenses. So they decrease IFIT-M2 and IFIT-M3, which are innate antiviral defense proteins. Um, we found that um, uh, SARS S antigen amplifies the SASP of senescent cells, much like uh, lipopolysaccharide. In fact, can amplify the SASP by well over a thousand fold, inflammatory mediators and so forth, and can make benign senescent cells become very pro inflammatory. Uh, working with Paul Robbins and Laura Niedernhofer, we found that uh, uh, a virus, mice don't have ACE2 receptors, so unlike hamsters, they don't get coronavirus, but they can get a related. I mean beta coronavirus, they get a related coronavirus infection called mouse hepatitis virus. We found that if we uh, infect old mice with this mouse hepatitis virus, which is common in pet store mice, old mice die within a couple of weeks. Young mice don't die at all. But if we, and I didn't have time to go into it, but we discovered ways of genetically clearing senescent cells. If we genetically clear senescent cells or use desatinib and carcetin or fazetin to clear senescent cells from the old mice that are infected, we reduce their death rates. Um, coronaviruses cause cells to become senescent, and I don't have time to go into it, but this is through uh, something called TLR3. Furthermore, uh, senescent cells take up three times more coronavirus than non-senescent cells. Furthermore, after, over time, senescent cells start mutating not only DNA, but also RNA, not only in the nucleus, but in the cytosol. And it's turning out in work that we've done with Clement Schmidt at the Charité in Berlin, Senescent cells um, mutate coronaviruses and appear to be a source of, um, uh, vir of, of modified viruses and some of, the, some of the variants that are appearing. This shows um, coronavirus um, uh, infected um, in human lung tissue compared to non, and there's a, there's a tremendous increase in senescent cell burden in the lungs of people who die of coronavirus as opposed to who die of other causes. Um, as I mentioned before, it looks like it's, uh, TLR3 is actually increased in senescent cells compared to non-senescent cells, and TLR3 is what recognizes RNA viruses on the surface of cells. And TLR3, as I mentioned, is what seems, senescent cells seem to use to make cells become senescent, because if we use TLR3 inhibitors, we prevent coronaviruses from causing cells to become senescent. <clears throat> 
So one of the things we formed um, a couple of years back, um, I'm unfortunate enough to be principal investigator on it, but it's called the Translational Jurist Science Network. So this is funded by the NIH. It includes the organizations listed at the top, and um, it's got some associate organizations that are becoming involved. And we're in the process of expanding this network. Across this network, we're doing a, a range of clinical trials. But I'll just show you first that in humans, we now know that um, oral administration for uh, three days of dasatinib and quercetin will clear senescent cells from adipose tissue and also reduce inflammation and fibrosis in a, in a small study. Um, so this, this just shows that we reduce activated macrophages in adipose tissue of obese diabetic um, humans where we give a short course of senolytics. Um, one of the things we've developed as part of this translational geroscience ne network is something called the Facility for Geroscience Analysis. So across all the clinical trials, we're analyzing the same things in blood, urine, sputum, um, uh, buccal swabs, uh, other body fluids that we can get. So we're measuring over 150 analytes, and these aren't just related to senescence, these are related to all of the pillars of aging. So we're looking at NAD-related stuff, TOR-related stuff, clotho, um, you know, sirtuins, uh, as well as uh, markers of uh, senescent cell burden across all the trials. Um, early on, we found a composite score is of some of these biomarkers. David Allison, who's uh, dean at University of Indiana and is an expert at developing composite scores. The Wang-Allison test, which I think most people would recognize as the main mortality statistic used by actuaries, was developed by him. Uh, so these, these people are two orders of magnitude ahead of people who use lasso techniques and things like that. This is a very early composite score, but we're developing later ones. And now there was a meeting in Washington a couple of weeks ago amongst a, bu a bunch of companies, um, including Big Pharma and Biotech, uh, philanthropists, uh, academics, and the FDA. And one of the things that we're working on is trying to develop composite scores that we can use in the public domain much like the internet was developed or a highway is developed. And a lot of the companies that have proprietary scores of senescence or other fundamental aging processes are at least in principle agreeing that they should do this because then they could run their truck down the highway and make money from their truck, but they'd be using a publicly funded highway. So the FDA is interested in this, but it's going to take three to five years to do this. Um, in a very early phase one open label clinical trial, with all the problems that phase one trials have, we looked at patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is clearly a senescence driven disease in older people and it's strongly associated with frailty. Now, there are learning effects and everything else, and these are very biased trials, and it was only to get data to do a phase 2A trial, which is now underway. But we used um, <clears throat> Desatinib and Kersetin in that trial, and we found some improvements in um, six-minute walk, uh, four-minute gait speed, chair stands, and short physical performance battery. I mentioned before alpha clotho. In that trial, we've looked at over 20 subjects now in their urine, because that's the best place to measure alpha clotho, and we found that alpha clotho went up in every single one of them who was treated. So that shows these uh, mechanisms are tied together. So the trial's underway. There are 30 trials underway, and there are another 15 planned. Uh, about half of them are with senolytics, the rest are with things like metformin, rapalogs, NAD precursors, anti-inflammatories, and some are minimal risk. And the trials range from trials uh, that we're doing with St. Jude and childhood cancer survivors that's funded by the NCI. We know that people who've had alkylating agent and uh, anthracycline or radiation treatment for cancers as children are developing an accelerated aging state, and by the time they're 35 or 40, some of these people are dying of Alzheimer's disease, uh, they've got diabetes, they've got osteoporosis, um, they're frail, they look like they're 70. So St. Jude follows their, um, their um, uh, people that they've treated throughout the remainder of their lives. They've got over 800 of these people. We did biopsies on them with Greg Armstrong and Carrie Ness there, and we found that senescent cell burden correlates with frailty in these people. So a trial is now underway um, of senolytics in those childhood cancer survivors. There's a similar trial which is almost finished now and showing, I'm touching wood somewhere, promising early results in bone marrow transplant survivors because these people get a very high dose of radiation and chemotherapy and they develop this accelerated aging-like state three to five years after their treatment. There are, trials under, there are three trials underway for Alzheimer's disease, one at Harvard for mild cognitive impairment. Um, there are uh, two trials for frailty using different senolytic regimens. Um, we've been studying the astronauts who are on the Axiom SpaceX uh, mission with uh, NASA. We find that senescent cells accumulate with short space flights. 
And uh, so NASA is very interested in this with respect to travel to uh, Mars. Uh, there are trials underway um, uh, for coronavirus, which I'll just mention two of them very quickly because we don't have, we're, we're really out of time. Uh, and there are multiple other trials that as a geriatrician, I never would have dreamed that we'd be treating children, you know, with Down syndrome, for example. So one of the trials is the covid fazetin trial. Um, these are all FDA-regulated trials. This one's in hospitalized patients with moderately severe coronavirus infection. Uh, and it's to see if we can, um, you know, and I don't know the results. So I won't go through it. Um, f I, I don't have time to really go through it. But it's intermittent dosing of uh, fazetin for these patients to see if we can reduce progression to ventilation. Uh, there's another uh, trial which is funded by the NIH in um, uh, older individuals in nursing homes, a uh, double-blind trial with uh, coronavirus infection. And it's to, uh, again, look at uh, delaying or preventing uh, progression of coronavirus uh, severity. Um, so I don't, have, I don't have time to go through all of that. Um, and there are other trials for coronavirus. We're doing minimal risk trials, uh, observational trials for uh, long COVID, for example, because we know in chronic HIV that that appears to be a senescence-related disease. And one of the trials we have underway with Northwestern University that's funded by the NIH and also crowdfunded by people with chronic HIV is using senolytics to try to alleviate chronic HIV syndrome. So, um, so the opportunities, um, it, there are data indicating that senolytics in experimental animals will enhance vaccine um, antibody response. Um, the, uh, there might be an opportunity with these kinds of agents, but we don't know, to attenuate infectious disease severity in, con in conjunction with antibiotics or antifungals or antivirals. Uh, so we, we treat, the people in these trials are all treated with antivirals and, and um, and uh, antibodies and all the rest of it, uh, the way they normally would be. But we just add this treatment, uh, layer it on and see if it works. I don't know if they will. Uh, we're very interested in post-infectious syndromes uh, and trials have already started in chronic HIV. And we're interested in this ramp-up hypothesis and we found in early data that um, if you successively infect an animal or expose it to uh, bacterial or viral antigens, each time you do it, there's a greater increase in senescent cell burden. And then some of the senescent cells persist. So our view is that this may be one of the ways that this happens. We also know there's spread of senescence. We've just completed a trial that's about to be published with Johns Hopkins, for example, where we've correlated the number of senescent cells in the knee joint of humans with the number of senescent cells we find in their cerebrospinal fluid because they're having spinal anesthesia. There's a direct relation. So we're wondering if in some of these um, infectious disease conditions, um, you know, as, as Dr. Rockwood was saying, whether part of the mechanism for accelerated uh, appearance of neurodegenerative diseases in these people may be related to uh, senescent cell spread to the brain. We don't know. So in conclusion, it looks like persistent senescent cells, ones that are not cleared by the immune system in time, uh, can cause inflammation, fibrosis, progenitor cell dysfunction. I didn't have time to go into that, but uh, there's a lot of evidence for that. Spread of senescence and multiple disease and age-related disorders, <clears throat> at least in various experimental animal systems. The target of senolytics is senescent cells, not a single molecule or pathway. So the FDA has been generous, and they haven't asked us for all kinds of pharmaco um, um, kinetics and that kind of thing. They're viewing this like developing antibiotics in a hit-and-run approach. It looks like in experimental animals that senolytics can attenuate tissue inflammation, fibrosis, improve function, um, reduce rejection, et cetera. Hit and run treatment, I didn't have time to go into all the experimental animal studies, but looks like it's more effective than continuous treatment and also reduces the opportunity for side effects. And that's why we use very short acting drugs. Um, these agents might work in humans, but we don't know yet. So the, the main thing that I tell people is absolutely do not take these drugs. They should not be prescribed. The only place for them is in carefully controlled clinical trials. There, anything that sounds too good to be true is. I don't know what the downsides are going to be. I can't sleep at night worrying that we're going to kill someone. Uh, so far, the DSMBs haven't stopped any of these trials, but I don't know what the outcomes are going to be. And humans are not big mice. I know a lot of humans who are big rats but humans aren't big mice. And there's only a 5% chance that a phase 2A trial will work. And that's why we've decided 
to do multiple trials in parallel instead of in series. And this approach we view very much as a complement to the TAME uh, approach, which some of you might have heard about, which is a more prevention kind of approach. We're dealing with serious diseases here. The TAME, using metformin, is to try to prevent a second multi uh, morbidity developing people who already have a first one. So my good friend near Barzilai, who was kind enough to put me up last night, because he lives near LaGuardia Airport when my plane was canceled, um, he's the proponent of that. So we view this as an and approach. And I'll just conclude by thanking a lot of people, especially Tamara Traconia and Izu, who came up with um, uh, Synalytics with me, and a lot of other collaborators and funding agencies. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions uh, from the audience? Great presentation. Uh, you, you spoke about a, a few times about the, you know, great presentation. Uh, you, you spoke about a, a few times about the, you know, this fine balance between uh, senolytic cells and cancer cells. Um, so what are the key defining features of uh, the cancer cell is the rapid division and they have elevations in de novo lipogenesis. Uh, obviously, uh, metformin and many of the agents you talk about are inhibitors of that pathway. Do you see yeah. that as a fine-tuning mechanism between the cancer cell and the uh, senolytic our, cell? Our, our view for what it's worth, and I intend to spend the next few years on this, working intensively, we've got data that I can't show with glioblastoma, triple negative breast cancer, and certain other cancers, that, um, you know, and the NIH has endorsed this approach in two uh, papers that were published in J JNCI as a one-two punch approach where you give um, anti-cancer treatment, then senolytics and anti-cancer treatment. Because it looks like what happens is cancers progress through a phase of senescence. They escape senescence and come back as worse tumors, particularly in the case of glioblastoma. So if, if you give radiation chemo um, to people with glioblastoma multiforme, for example, you either kill cells through necrosis or necroptosis, or you drive those cells into senescence. And they're sitting there waiting like time bombs uh, to escape senescence because they develop these transpositional events called line one element events and they can escape senescence after a couple of months and nobody but nobody essentially with glioblastoma lives more than 16 months. They all look like they're quite a bit better for three or four months and then it comes back in a terrible way. We've discovered a new class of drugs I can't talk about very much at the moment uh, that sensitizes those tumor bearing senescent cells that are resistant to senolytics to become sensitive to senolytics. So we're, we're envisaging a one, two, three, four punch approach where we will cycle different kinds of chemo and radiation with different senolytics, then with different classes of these drugs, and then with another class of senolytics, and then do that in cycles, much like you use cycles for Hodgkin's disease or whatever. There's pretty good evidence now for multiple myeloma that this appears to be working by Megan Vivoda, who's um, a really brilliant um, um, cancer biologist and certain other tumors. So I think there'll be um, a marriage between senolytic approaches and uh, chemo and radiation for particularly aggressive cancers like triple negative breast cancer or glioblastoma and melanoma too. That's great. Yeah, I mean, it sounds very consistent with what we found uh, with our development of de novo lipogenesis inhibitors really sensitizing cells to, uh, you know, uh, radiation or uh, chemical toxicities. Right. Thank you. And again, I want, to, I want to personally devote the next five or ten years of my life to this because I think that's the most pressing thing. I, I hated it when I was a medical student. I saw people dying of glioblastoma. I just couldn't stand it. Yeah, great. Yeah, wonderful talk. Um, one of the questions I have relates to sort of the homeostatic role of, of senescent cells. And, you know, uh, in the context of infection, one of the outcomes often in the lung can be fibrosis. And we often think of that as bad, but then, you know, if you talk to, to people who study pulmonary biology, they'll often counter that with saying, well, it's not great, but if the other option was death, then it's, it's better than that outcome. So on that, on that sort of trajectory, are there situations that you've encountered where senolytics are essentially the removal of senescent cells actually exacerbates a disease process. And the reason I ask is because I think that provides really critical insight into, you know, 
what safety considerations are more generally, right, for treating different disease well, indications? Well, our view and the FDA's strong view is that we don't give senolytics to people unless they have senescent cells. That's number one. So we're developing tests to track that. Um, number two, um, I think they're, <clears throat> you know, the good thing about senolytics as opposed to genetic clearance. The genetic clearance models, you're getting rid of the pro-growth as well as the pro-apoptotic senescent cells, so you actually interfere with wound healing. Senolytics improve wound healing because you're only getting rid of those senescent cells that are pro-inflammatory and pro-apoptotic. So we've got studies coming out soon with chronic diabetic skin ulcers in vervet monkeys, you know, because old, wor old world monkeys don't get diabetes, new world yeah. monkeys do, but aging vervet monkeys. And uh, we're trying to move to clinical trials for chronic non-healing diabetic skin ulcers, which are ringed by senescent cells. So it depends. And then the same thing with spinal cord transection, where you get a fibrous ring. Uh, so we're doing studies there that look um, uh, promising that are, that are preclinical at this point. So it depends on the stage of fibrosis. And I think with all of these agents, there are going to be times when it's good to administer them and times not. Like, I would not want to give an NAD precursor to a 90-year-old who might be harboring precancerous lesions because you would give the cancer a selective advantage. You know, where senolytics might, might be the right thing at that point. So we want to develop um, a menu of GERA diagnostics and then the right testing so that eventually, you know, I'm not interested in biomarkers. I, the best biomarker is my birth certificate and my pocket calendar. Who cares? You know, what we're interested in is what we call GERA diagnostics. That's things that respond to interventions that predict and track disease, and if you treat, get better, you know, or, or change, to indicate that you're, you're getting an improvement with the condition. And the FDA has a whole series of things that they say you have to be able to do with the GERA diagnostic. They're not interested in simple aging clocks. You know, so, but I think it's going to be important to have GERA diagnostics to eventually have labs on a, on a, on a stick, uh, so that one day, maybe in a dream world, five or 10 years from now, a doctor's office or a drugstore, you could do a urine dipstick, because we're finding urine is even better than blood for measuring a lot of these analytes, because you, you get a cumulative sample and it's relatively clean. You might be able to say, the physician might be able to say, it's time to give this or that intervention. Um, you know, and it may be a lifestyle intervention, it may be a nutritional um, uh, modification, it may be a drug. Uh, or it's time that another intervention is contraindicated, Here's a prediction of what's going to happen, et cetera, et cetera. So in a dream world, maybe, maybe that'll happen. And that's why we're putting so much emphasis on this facility for gyroscience science analysis. And that's why I think your samples are going to be very valuable that you've got stored up from, you know, your stuff. Just study. downstairs. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thanks very much, Jim, for a wonderful talk. And